to start it. Uh, hello, welcome to the webinar Fundamentals of R for Biologists. So hello all you biologists out there. Uh, today we're going to have a very uh, little bit cram-packed but uh, hopefully very very informative webinar on how to actually use the R programming language with a very specific focus on biologists. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a quick outline of what this is actually going to look like. Uh, I'm then going to just really dive in. The, the general overview is that there's going to be about 30 to 45 minutes of content, just our stuff, and then uh, questions and answers. I have a whole section dedicated to that right at the end. So if you have any burning questions, you want a little more information on something, uh, please, uh, Feel free to put it in chat. I'll try to keep a mental note of where they're at. Might have to ask you to repeat it, but hey, we got it. And with that, uh, let's just hop right into it. So let me make sure all of my stuff is good. So I should have a, haha, it's a little bit off. So I do have an outline here. Uh, this is a very, very rough outline. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to start off with the very basics. I, I am going to assume uh, all skill levels of R here. So if you already know how to set a working directory and what RStudio even is, then this first section will probably be review. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about tidyverse and packages as a whole. Tidyverse is an extraordinarily useful package. And I, I really do believe that if you are learning R, you should learn with tidyverse. Uh, and I'll explain why, and hopefully that'll be clear closer to the end of this uh, presentation. Then we're going to spend about 10, 15 minutes on just cleaning and manipulating data. This is really what 90% of, in my opinion, what 90% of R is, is just cleaning data, moving it around, merging it with other data sets. Uh, so I want to spend a good amount of time on that. Uh, 10 minutes is an estimate. Probably going to spend a little longer. We're going to spend a little bit of time on just doing some quick summary analyses. So if you just want to get uh, how many species are in this area, what is the diversity, how many records do we have, this is that section for that. Uh, and then we're going to end on visualization. And I am going to be using ggplot2. Uh, to visualize, which is the most widely used visualization package for R. And it's actually included with Tidyverse, so an another reason I recommend to use Tidyverse. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, we have the last little bit, which is just going to be questions and answers. So that's just a very quick overview. Uh, but let's start with those very, very basics. So if we open up R uh, in RStudio, so this is RStudio. Let me. Uh, Make it look a little bit better. So all our studio is is a program that is used for coding in R. And let me actually make this just a little bit smaller. I'm noticing that it's uh, just slightly cut off. Apologies for this. Um, and it's still cut off. Look at that. So uh, our studio, uh, like I mentioned, is a software that is used for coding in R. I'm going to leave it just like this. And one of the biggest benefits is that because it's tailor-made for the R environment, we're going to keep it like this, um, is that it makes it much easier to work with. So there are really four sections that we're going to have to look at. Uh, and we're going to start by creating a new script. So if we look up at the very top left, I don't know why all of this is now a little bit messed up. Look at that. Uh, if we look at the very top left, of our area. There's a little white box. This is the source. Uh, uh, sorry, this is not the source. If we create a new script, this creates the source. The source is really where you should be spending 90% of your time in R. This is where you will create your own scripts, which scripts, for those un, uh, unenthused into the programming world, uh, are just instructions for you to manipulate your data and work with it. We'll, we'll touch more on scripts in a little bit. Uh, over on the right hand side is our environment whenever we uh, this is the top right whenever we actually create variables and import data into R this is where it shows up and we'll be able to get a preview of it uh, we do have this window down in the bottom right and this is where we can see our files we also have a plotting window which of course we'll do today so you'll see what plots look like uh, as well as help documentation and what packages we have in R uh, already installed and then finally, in the bottom left is our console. This is just where code gets executed. And what that means is this is where code is run. Uh, we can also run code directly in here. So R, most people show you, is a calculator when they're first learning. So if I type in 2 plus 2 and hit Enter, uh, we'll see our result is 4. 
So that's just some very, very quick overview of RStudio and R. Uh, just as a refresher, R is free, RStudio is free. You just need to Google it and download it. Um, and just to kind of uh, get on to the next little section, um, you should have gotten, uh, if you RSVP'd for this course, I sent you an ebook. And that ebook is actually tied in to a course that I have. Uh, and the first section of this course, this is like the most plugging I'm going to do, um, just shows you an introduction to R&R &R Studio. Uh, so I, my face is covering it, but there are lessons dedicated to uh, loading data into R, what is R Studio, how to download it, all that stuff. Um, this is just up on the website, so learneventuallycity.com. Uh, and this is actually a good point to talk about the next section, which is the working directory. I already had it loaded, but of course I clicked on it. So whenever we work in R, we're going to work in a working directory. This is just a folder on your computer that R has access to, and it's going to be the spot where you can put data in for R to use. So uh, on my desktop, uh, which means I have to minimize out of everything, uh, I have a folder called webinar. Uh, let's put it right here in the center so it's a little bit easier to see. And in this folder I have a couple data sets. So uh, let me zoom in on one that way we can uh, see them a little bit easier. So the data that we're working with today, uh, this is my working directory. Again I've placed my data inside of here and we're going to be working with two different data sets. The first one you see it here it's called GBIF Amphib Meso. Um, I always try to name my data sets something that is somewhat descriptive. Um, and this data set is going to be this right here. So this is GBIF. Uh, GBIF is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And the data we are specifically working with today is a just shy of about 800,000 occurrences of open access data for amphibians of Mesoamerica. Now, the, the, the border is a little bit weird. And uh, that's basically because this is actually my master's research. I work with this data set as well as a few other ones. Um, so I just thought, I will use that. Now, again, if you're just now joining, I will send out the links to download this data yourself after the webinar. There's some always issues with a little bit of copyright with data, so I didn't want to send stuff out I'm not allowed to. So, uh, But you will be able to access this data set. And what this data is, is it is occurrence records uh, pulled from museum records, sources like iNaturalist, as well as uh, various research projects. And it has, in many cases, photos. However, also latitude, longitude, uh, elevation, and full taxonomic uh, breakdown. So this species is in, you know, what species, genus, family, order, blah, blah, blah. The second data set we're working with, uh, which is in this folder, I just alt tabbed over to it, uh, is titled Amphibio V1. Amphibio is an awesome open access data set, uh, which the publication is here, and it is a global database for amphibian traits. Uh, I really, really enjoy this data set. It's not complete, uh, and you know, it's I'm not mad that it's not complete because this is still amazing, but it has various metrics down to the species level, such as body mass, body size, uh, what is their habitat preference. Uh, so this is a really useful data set. And like I said, it's open access, meaning you could download this today regardless of if you're with the university or anything else. All right, so now that we've kind of given you a little bit of a preview of the data, let's actually get this data into R and start working with it. Now, the first thing we have to do is set that working directory. So in R, what we're going to be doing is I always write everything inside of a script. Uh, some people like to do only console. That's fine. I'm going to write everything in a script. That way I can rerun things when I need to. So let's set our working directory. So the command here is set WD. That is the function. Uh, and I think I want to make this a little bit bigger, just so you guys can see it a little bit nicer when I'm zoomed in. OK. So and let me know if any of the text is too small. Um, in fact, let's just zoom in a tiny bit as well, like this. Perfect. So this is set WD. That is set working directory. Inside of that, we need to tell R where that folder on our computer is. Now, I mentioned my folder is on my desktop, right? That means that it is right here. Uh, it's living here. Uh, you can't see that. Uh, it's living right here on my desktop. Uh, and if I go into the folder, this is the trick that I always taught my undergrad students uh, when we were setting working directories. 
the quickest way to find the working directory of a folder is to click inside this address bar right here, uh, right there. That's your working directory. This is just instructions to tell R, hey, that folder is underneath users. It's dilj, because that's me, uh, desktop, and then webinar. That's it. That's a working directory. It's just instructions about where to go. So I copied that. I just did a command C. And now in R, I'm going to add in quotation marks, single or double. R does not care about single or double quotation marks. Uh, either work. And I'm going to paste that in. Now, the only thing with R is that I do need to switch this from backslashes. Wait, I, my camera's flipped. From backslashes, from backslashes to forward slashes. Uh, so we'll just change that really quickly. Now, there are other ways to set the working directory. Um, you can actually set it through some, some settings in the files pane down in the bottom right. So if we went into uh, this, this area right down here, and we clicked on, I believe it's more. Yeah, you can set the current folder you're in as a working directory. That's totally fine. You can do that if that works for you. However, I like to have it in my script. That way I know exactly where I'm working out of. And this has saved me so much time if I'm trying to find a specific file. Cool. Now we need to make sure we run this code. You can run code by hitting the run button. Again, if you already know this, this is very basic. We're starting with nothing. Uh, or you can hit Control Enter. I'm going to hit Run this time, and I'm going to go under the small view so you can see what happens when I hit Run. So once I hit Run, you'll see that it got sent down into the console, right? Uh, I'll, I'll hit Run again just so you can see it. I hit Run, and then, uh, oh, sorry, I need to be on that line. Hit Run. Now that it is down in our console, that little bit of code was executed in our console. It was run in our console. And we know that the working directory is set. You can always see what working directory you're in at the top of the console, right? Right up there, uh, it says exactly where your working directory is. So we know it's set. We know we can access the data. What's next? Now we need to load data in. This has, if you're not used to working with files, this is often a point of uh, concern and it can be confusing, absolutely. So these two files are CSV files. If you are unable to see that file extension, that little .csv portion, you just need to mess with settings in your, um, uh, in your, ah, in your file explorer in on this window. Uh, so you just go to view, hide, and then show those file extensions. This is really important for R. And sometimes some machines just don't show you file extensions. And I think it's really annoying. Um, so let's load in this amphibian data set. Now, this is a CSV file. In most cases, we're going to use the read functions. So read.csv. And we're just going to type out the name of that file. Because it's in our working directory, R already knows to just look in there by default. Now, we need to make sure we spell it exactly, including capitalizations and underscores. So gbif amphib meso. So gfib, in all caps, underscore amphib meso dot csv. And if we run this, um, let's see, is there a typo? Do, 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 gbif amphib meso. Oh, gbif. Why am I saying gfib? Um, gbif amphib meso. Uh, it is now running in our console. Uh, so what it will do if we do not assign it to anything is that it will run in our console. This is a little bit of a big data set. So for it to display down here, it takes a little bit of time. But this is not really usable for us. This just shows us the data, right? What we want to do is we want to assign this data to an object. And in R, this is really, really easy. We just have the name of our object. So I'm going to do DF. This stands for data frame. This is a standard in R. And now we are going to assign it by making an arrow. You can also do an equal sign. However, I think the arrow is a little bit better for clarity's sake. And the way we read this is just that the data from read.csv, the data that we're reading from that file, is going into the object df. And if we run this, I'm going to zoom out again so you can see, look up here in our environment, up in the top right. If we run this, it takes a second. It's a little bit of a big data set. Um, 800,000 occurrences. Boom. Uh, 300,000 observations. There we go. Uh, so in our environment, we now have the object df. We named that. We can name it whatever we want. We can call this frog. We can call this whatever. Um, but here, we're going to call it df. 
And if we click on this little blue circle, we can actually get a preview of our data. This is a great way to just check if everything is there. We can see all of the columns. So each of these uh, thing, each of these names with the dollars next to it is a column. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus. We have country codes, localities, decimal latitudes. We have all sorts of data here. Um, now, let's do that exact same thing for the Amphibio data set. And I'm just going to be lazy. I'm just going to copy and paste code. Uh, that is totally fine. This is the beauty of coding, is that you don't have to do everything all over again. And remember, this is called Amphibio underscore V1 with bio capitalized. And let's name it thusly Amphi bio underscore v1 and we're going to give it a different name in this case we're going to call it amphibio so run that and it loaded in very very quickly over in our environment we now have that amphibio data set alongside our occurrence data set so you can see here that there are order family genus species terrestrial aquatic arboreal that's what t-e-r-a-q and r-a-r-b stand for as well as things like litter size reproductive out output um, are they direct developers larval are they live birth uh, body mass body size there, there's a lot of data here that we are going to play around with okay we're almost out of the basics uh, i promise the only thing we have to do is just install a package and load a package so I mentioned that we are going to be using the tidyverse package. I love tidyverse so, 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 so much. Uh, so what tidyverse is, 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 <laughs> is that it is a uh, package that is actually multiple packages combined specifically catered for data science. So we have the dplyr data set, which is really good for manipulating data, ggplot2, which is awesome for, uh, well, you know, ggplotting, uh, visualizing your data. We have things like Stringer, which is really good for manipulating strings, if you ever have to do that, and a few other really important packages. Now, regardless of the package, uh, in R, you always need to install the package, and then you need to load the package. Installation is like buying a book from the bookstore and putting it on your shelf. Loading the package is like pulling the book off the shelf and reading the information through it. So. Um, I already have Tidyverse installed, but if you needed to install it, uh, let's zoom in on the source. It is install.packages and then the name of the package. In this case, it would be oopsies, uh, Tidyverse. And you'll have to put it inside of those quotation marks. So if you run this, it will install the package for you. Sometimes packages need a little bit of extra installation help, but this is how you install it. And then you can load that package. So again, like pulling that book off the bookshelf with the command library. And in here, you can just type out the name of the actual library. Uh, now, just because you wrote it doesn't mean anything. Uh, you know, I can write, I can just write absolute gibberish, but uh, that doesn't actually mean anything is happening. Uh, so we need to always run our code. Again, installation has already been done. It won't install for me properly. It'll ask me like restart my session and all this. But um, to run Tidyverse, I'm just going to run this. And uh, I'll show you what it says in my console. Uh, so down on my console, it just says it's attaching some packages, showing any conflicts, um, warning messages with packages. You can, this is probably like terrible advice, but you can probably just ignore it 90% of the time unless it is an error. Okay, but now because we have Tidyverse, we have access to all of the functions that Tidyverse has curated. So these include functions like ggplot, like filter. Um, oh, apparently, it's Groundhog Day. Look at that. Um, and many other functions that we can use. And we're just going to start on that really quickly. Now, this data set that we're working with, this DF data set, there are north of 300,000 observations, 51 variables. That is a lot of data to manage. What I'm going to show you first is the function select. By far, one of my most useful functions that I utilize often. Now, in Tidyverse, there is a operation called a pipe. Let's type out the name of our data set. Again, we named it DF, so we're going to manipulate it by calling it that same name DF. And we're going to add in percent sign, the little like greater than symbol, greater than symbol, and then another percent sign. This is a pipe. And what it means is that it's the data from the left-hand side is flowing onto the right-hand side. So if we use a function called select, what select does is that it selects columns from a data set. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to select the names of the columns that we want to look at. 
And just as a reminder, if you're joining in late, um, you don't have to download any data. Um, this is all you will. I will show you how to download the data at the after the webinar. There will be a full workthrough. But select. Uh, let's just select a few columns. So if I select just class and order, for example, um, and I'm going to run this code again, Control Enter, we can see in our console that it outputs this big data set that we have, but only with those two columns. Everything else was removed. That's what select does. So if you want to just eliminate bloat in your uh, in your data sets, this is a really good way of doing it. Now, um, I've already selected a whole bunch of columns. What we're going to do is we're going to select uh, class order, but also family, genus, species. Uh, I'll also include decimal latitude and decimal longitude. We're not actually going to use that today, but uh, they are now being selected. And just to make this a little bit easier for you to see, there's a really nifty thing you can do. Uh, move myself up. And I think we should actually zoom this out just a bit. There we go. Perfect. Um, you can actually put your next function on the next line following that pipe. And it will still run properly. So all we're doing here is we are just pulling those columns that we want to look at. So class, order, family, genus, species, latitude, longitude. Uh, they need to be spelled exactly the same. But of course, this is a uh, massive data set. You could use whatever you want for this. This is all we're going to take from that GBIF data set. And now I want to show you another function. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to do, we're going to filter it. Okay. Now the function, again, is just going to be called filter. Let's make this a little bit wider. I want to make sure you guys can see everything. Perfect. Okay. So this function, filter, well, it filters the data. And this is where we're going to introduce logic. So GBIF data notoriously has records that are missing the species. OK, so they are absolutely changing the species. Uh, sorry, they, they don't have species in them. So what I want to do is I want to remove blank records. OK, and we're going to do that by typing out species and if we want to find stuff that is equal to it, so say we only wanted to keep species, uh, let me just see if there's one. Let me see, what is? what are we going to do? What species? Um, let's do uh, Encilius nebulifer, right? I, I believe that taxonomy hasn't changed. Um, so Encilius nebulifer. And I'm hoping I'm spelling that right. Perfect, we got it right. What this did, this filter kept only records that were in Cilius Nebulifer, the Gulf Coast Toad. And we can see that down in our console. Now, we're going to save over our data set in just a second. But here, we just have that. Now, we obviously want to keep all the amphibians for this. So what we're going to do is instead of equal to, we're going to change that first equal sign to an exclamation point. That means not. So it's not equal to in Cilius Nebulifer. But in this case, because we're removing blank records, we're going to give it a blank string, so no information. And this is going to remove those records that are blank. That, that's what this does. And now, instead of sending it down into our console, because this is the nice thing about R right now, is that it hasn't actually altered our data at all. It hasn't changed this DF data set. We still have 300,000 observations, 51 variables, because we haven't assigned it to anything. Now, what we could do is we could assign it to df again. But what that will do is it will overwrite our data. You may want that. I don't want that. So instead, I'm going to name it OCC, which just stands for occurrences. And usually what I do is I just add in the word clean. So OCC underscore clean. Now, if I run this, it's going to go into our environment. Because again, all objects we create are in our environment. And if we now look at our environment, instead of having some giant data set, that was 300,000 observations, 51 variables. It's now considerably fewer. 250,000 observations and seven variables. So this is telling us that based on our code, we had about 50,000 records that were missing uh, species names. Cool. Now, I'm going to speed this up a bit, and we're going to do the exact same thing for the Amphibio data set. We're going to select some things, and then I'm also going to show you the mutate function. So Amphibio. Amphibio, ooh, ooh, amphibio, ooh, ba -da -boo, uh, select, and we're going to select, we're just going to select three columns. So just species, uh, body mass, 
Again, these are all spelled exactly. The nice thing is R will often autocorrect for you and body size. Now again, these are just selecting those three columns. Now I want to show you the mutate function. Mutate will add columns to your data set by running some function or calculation. And what we first need to input is the actual name that we want to do of the data set of the, of the new column. So in this case, let's just say I want to convert uh, millimeters to centimeters, right? So let's do body, body size, uh, body size mm. Uh, yep. And then we're going to set this equal to another one. So body size mm, and we're going to divide it by 10 because um, centimeters is, you know, divided by 10. Uh, we'll run this, make sure it looks good uh, before we assign it to anything. It looks great. We have a new column uh, that got pushed down, it looks like. Um, oh, I overwrote it. I overwrote body size mm, and this is why you always check your data beforehand. So I want to change it to uh, cm at the start, and there we go. Now down in our console, we have four columns. Uh, we selected three, and then we created this body size cm column using that mutate function. Um, and again, all of this is actually listed out in great detail in my ebook um, or on the online course. So let's just call this uh, Amphibio Clean. Amphibio Clean. So this was a very, very simple cleaning pipeline. Like this is absurdly simple. Um, select, filter, and mutate. Usually is like ninety percent of what your uh, what your cleaning of a data set is. And now, up our environment, we have two data sets. We have Amphibio Clean and we have OCC Clean. Uh, so that is our Amphibio data set and our occurrence data set. Now, what I want to do is I want to merge these two data sets together. This is a super, super, super common uh, procedure that we need to do in R. Uh, say you have data from multiple sites and you want to link them all together, or you have IUCN data as well as data from GBIF and you want to merge them together so you can actually use them properly. Probably the easiest function is just merge. Now, this doesn't work for all data sets, of course. Sometimes you need to have uh, specific data. Uh, but we'll go into the merge data set. And I'm going to add in a bunch of spaces so that it pushes it up to the top. Now, what merge does is it takes in two data sets, right? Uh, and if we look here, you'll see this little tooltip, that little yellow box. It says x and y. We're going to need to remember that x is our first data set and y is our second data set. It usually doesn't matter which one is x, which one is y, uh, but I'll show you why we call things x and why we call things y in a second. So let's enter our two data sets. So let's just do OCC clean, and we now need to do uh, Amphibio clean. Amphibio clean. Now we need column to combine these data on, right? If you're working on an environmental consulting project and you have, uh, if you want to combine all of the data for one of your, you know, uh, technicians, uh, you may combine on technician name or technician ID. If you're working with data sets uh, such as this biodiverse data set, pretty common one is to combine them based on species. Now, I chose this data very, very explicitly and very intentionally to make this easy. If we look in our data set, we have Amphibio Clean. We have a species column. And if we look in our occurrence clean data set, we also have a species column. What we're going to do is we're going to merge on species. Now note though, note though, while both the columns say species, Amphibio is species with a capital S. The GBIF data set is species with a lowercase s. And we're going to specify that in our merge function. So here in by.x, if they're named exactly the same, by the way, if they're spelled the exact same way, you can just use the, the argument by, but here we're going to do by.x. Speaking about x and y, x is that first data set. So in occurrence clean, it's a lowercase species. So we're going to do by.x equal to species. And then just like you would think, by.y for the y data set, in this case, Amphibio, it's our second data set. It's in the y position. And this one is going to be species with a capital letter. Now, I'm not going to show you, uh, I misspelled it, uh, species. Now, I'm not going to show you it outputting to the console. We're just going to immediately assign this to an object. Uh, also, a good point to note, you can assign objects at the end, not just at the beginning, uh, just by pointing the arrow in the other direction. So species here, we're just going to call it DF merge. I, I like to use that uh, d denotation. It just says it's a merged data set. 
Now it's running in the console, it's going through, and it is merging all of our data. And if we look at our data now, we have a new data set, DF merge. And it's about 249,000 observations, okay? So you may be thinking, why is this number a little bit off? Why do we not have 250,000 data sets? Why do we not have 6,000 from Amphibio? And that's because of how different things merge. So let me show you, I actually have this on a, uh, on a little uh, thing. So there are many different types of merges, okay? What we are doing is this first one up here, where X and Y, we're only keeping overlapping data. So there may have been species that were not in the GBIF data set that weren't included, as well as species in the Amphibio data set that were not included. Uh, so that's here. What we can use are different ways to say, hey, maybe I want all of the records that are in X, but not all the ones in Y. Or I want all the records that are in Y and not X. Or I just want all the records combined together. And you can specify that with the all.x and all.y, and it's true and false. So if I wanted, uh, just for example's sake, if I wanted all.x, this would give me all of the records in the x data set, in this case, occurrence clean, and set it equal to true. That, that's all you would need to do. Let me zoom in on the source so you can see that. All.x equals true pulls everything from the x. You could also do all equals true, and that just combines them everywhere. Um, where things do not overlap properly, you will get NA values. So just make sure you're using this appropriately. In the post webinar breakdown, I'll actually show you examples for all of these. Uh, but for the sake of time, we're going to move on to summarization. Um, Want to make sure we have enough time to also do visualization and everything else. So visualization, uh, er, sorry, <laughs> summarization basically just means cool we have this data we have it cleaned uh this is where we start to analyze this is where we start to understand our data and um one really useful function that is a little confusing I, I fully admit it is very confusing to start working with is the group by function this is also from tidyverse but it is an incredibly powerful function so what group by does, uh, let's turn this into a slideshow. Let's make me small and let's go to the next one. Uh, so I accidentally forgot to remove the ending. So I'm going to cover it up. So let's say we have some data set, right? Uh, we have a column that's Z and we have a column that's X. We want to get the mean of X for each group in the Z column. Okay. So we want to get the mean for group A. We want to get the mean for group B. We want to get the mean for group C. And that's actually what this function up here is going to do. It's going to group by Z, so Z is our grouping column, and summarize uh, summarizes things, and we're going to get the mean of X. So what this does, group by Z will find all of the unique values within that Z column, so in this case A's, B's, C's, and group them according to that. Then it will run whatever function you want on each of those data sets individually. So we have the group A, it's going to run the mean of that X column there, okay? Then it's going to run the mean of the X column for group B, then the mean of X for group C. It runs them individually. And then it's going to output a single data set, if you're using summarize, that actually shows, hey, what is the mean for group A? What is the mean for group B? What is the mean for group C? So that's how group by works. Uh, if you need to like Look at this. Uh, I'll make sure to include it in the R markdown so you can see it like, crouching underneath my own top bar. Um, but let's work on this in R. So we want to group by, right? We want to group by our uh, data. So grab the wrong thing. Uh, so let's group by. Uh, let's say we want to group by. Uh, we want to know in our data set. We want to know uh, the count of, of families. Uh, we want to know how many records of each family are in there. Uh, so group by family. Let's make sure we actually have our data set. So df merge. We'll add that pipe again so that the data flows into group by. And we're going to group by family. And then I'm going to use a very simple function. It's just called count. And it just gets the count of the data. So uh, this is outputted into our console. And what we see down here in our console is, would you look at that? We have the counts of each family in our data set. So this is showing us the number of records 
in our data set. So uh, Imbistomatidae, which is the Imbistomid salamanders, your big tiger salamanders. There's about 9,500 records in here. Uh, where other ones, like your Bufonidae, which is your you know your toads, your true toads, are uh, about 24,000 records. Uh, Cecilidae is about 682. Your Cecilians have about 682 records. Uh, and that was done very, very easily. Again, we just did really two or three lines of code. Um, so it's DF merge group by count. That, that's really it. Group by is extraordinarily useful. Now let's do another one. Um, I showed you in the um, in the um, in the example we showed you uh, summarize and mean. So let's summarize. Summarize just summarizes the data. Uh, it'll output a call a, a data set that only has the summary metrics you need. Mean. And let's just get the mean body size for each family, right? So uh, across all of them, how many uh, is the mean? Uh, now, there is a thing that I know I have to do here. We actually have to filter out NA values. Uh, some species are not represented in Infobio. They may not have the, um, the, the value. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to add a filter up here. This is also kind of the nice thing about pipelines is that you can just very easily uh, plug and play. And because we're doing multiple pipelines, it's flowing into one another. So first we have the data set, then it groups them, then it summarizes. So before we group it, before we summarize it, I want to add a filter. Filter. And let's just filter it out by using not. Again, exclamation point is not. And we're going to use is.na. This checks for na values, another really important function to know. And we want to make sure there's no na values in our body size metric. So body size cm make sure we add a pipe at the end we run this we can actually now see in our console that the average body size for imbistomata day was about 24 centimeters uh amphiumidae is about 91 and this is adult sizes by the way these are not uh you know every single record had the size people weren't doing that this is the maximum adult or probably average adult size that's something you need to check on the amphibio data set but um we did that very very easily like so th this is what i'm trying to say with tidyverse is that it is a very 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 useful package because it allows you to very easily get summary statistics such as this uh so up at the zoom source again there's really only uh you know there's, there's a lot of extra bloat here but you could also absolutely add this pipeline up here uh if you wanted to just use the amphibio data set uh but here we have a full data set that we can actually get very quick summary statistics in less than 20 lines of code. Uh, and this is stuff that you could absolutely use on a full research project. Now, there's a lot of different ways to summarize things. We could spend a whole webinar on just summarizing data sets, and maybe we should do that. Um, but I want to focus on ggplot, because ggplot is the bane of existence for so many people, me included. I always have reference up and don't feel bad for having references up. Um, or you're, you're not being tested, or you might be. Actually, I say that. I have students who I had to test on their memorization of R. Um, but in reality, you always have help documentation up. You always have a textbook up. You always have a website up. And don't feel bad about using it. Absolutely use it. So. Let's do a ggplot. Let's make a beautiful plot using ggplot. What we're going to do is we're going to use the ggplot function. The first part of the ggplot function is the data we want to use. And I'm going to make this explicit. I'm actually going to show you exactly what. You don't have to add this data equals in technically, but it makes it a little bit easier to follow along and to make sure you're not messing up. So we're going to use that df merge data set, right? That's what we want to plot. We want to plot that data. Now, with ggplot, we have something called aesthetics. And we specify that with AES. This is the most confusing part for uh, newbies to ggplot. And it, it confused me for, for many years. So don't, you know, it's confusing. What aesthetics are is it's going to pull data from the data that you specify. So here, it's DF merge. Anything we put in aesthetics should be in that data set, DF merge, OK? So here we're going to specify what we want on the x and y axes. We're going to make a very simple scatter plot, and we're just going to look at body size to body mass. So on the x axis, we're going to assume body size is influencing body mass. So body mass, body size being the independent variable here. Um, so body size 
cm. And you just type it out. You don't need to add quotation marks. Typically, if it's in aesthetics, you typically do not need quotation marks because it's, it's data that is already in R and R knows where to pull it from. Now on our Y, we're going to do the same thing, but with body mass. So body mass G. And this is just going to what the ggplot function does. I just ran it. If we look down at our plot window, um, it actually just makes the plot, but it doesn't plot the data. Okay, so we see that on our x-axis we have body size, on our y-axis we have body mass. Perfect, that's exactly what we wanted. However, we want to have a actual plot. We want to have a scatter plot. Um, what we can do is now back in our source, we add a plus symbol. This is a ggplot specific symbol. On a new line, just to make it cleaner, we're going to add in geom underscore point. Now, geom in ggplot specifies the type of plot. It tells us how do we want our data to actually be plotted on that beautiful plot we made with ggplot. So if I run this uh, down in the plot window, now it's taking a bit because I have a lot of data in here. Uh, I see Barry is playing Bloons Tower Defense 6. I actually don't remember who Barry is. Um, now, do, 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 do. it's taking a second. We should have We should have cleaned our data a little bit. This is trying to plot 250,000 points. Ah, but there we go. We now have our ggplot. And it just plotted a very simple scatter plot, all the points. We see that when body size is 100, body mass is 1,000. That's probably one of the like amphiomas or something, something big. Um, now, this data is a little bit tricky. I'm, I'm going to actually scale our data. And I'm going to do this very quickly just to make sure it looks clean. So we do scale uh, x continuous because our data on the x-axis is continuous data. Uh, and I'm just going to make the transformation, which we specify with the trans argument, uh, is going to be, I'm going to do log base 10. I looked this up ahead of time uh, because I wanted to make sure it looked good. So we're going to make sure this is there. And I'm going to do the same thing for the y axis. I, I played around with this um, most of the time. This is the best transformation you need to do. Uh, but trans uh, equals log 10. Uh, again, putting a plus symbol around everything. Uh, so, and let's rerun this uh, and let's go down to the plot. It might take a second to do this. Uh, with that scale x, scale y continuous, there's a lot of different ways to transform your data. They also allow like square root transformations. Um, but yeah, let's see. Let's make sure this plots. Um, I really think I should have done it. There we go. So now we have a much better visualization. It actually looks a little bit cleaner. It's just log transform. Um, but this data is kind of uninformative. We, we know that, hey, as things get bigger, they weigh more. <laughs> no way. Um, of course, we know this. But let's actually use some of the really cool portions of ggplot to make this better. What we're going to do is inside of geom point, we're going to add in another aesthetics. And remember, aesthetics pulls from the data in our data set. So if we want to change something in ggplot, let's say we want to change the color of our points, we do so with color. And let's make the color equal to the family. So what family is that organism in? OK. Uh, actually, for this one, let's start with order. Let's start with order, uh, just because it'll be a little bit cleaner. Uh, I'm remembering this. So go back down our plot window. We just ran this. We're going to color our points according to order. Remember, they are inside of the aesthetics. If you try to place them outside of the aesthetics, it will just color them all red and say it's order. So that's if that's happening, try to put your data inside of aesthetics. Again, no quotation marks. Uh, there we go. Now, this might be a little hard for you to see. I'm actually going to make this size a little bit bigger. So we're going to do size equal to 3. I actually spelled size backwards. That's a weird one. Um, while that is running. And you can actually already see in this data set that there are some really interesting trends that break out according to order. Uh, it's giving it a second, blah, blah, blah. This is something that is only doable on this computer, I think, because my computer's a little beefy. Um, obviously, if I have Steam notifications running all the time, that probably outs me a bit. There we go. 
So I just change the size so everything's a little bigger. We can see that the anurans are the, the, the frogs and toads. They're, they're, they're clustering over here on the left-hand side. The, the caudates, which are your salamanders, caudata, they're a little bit more to the right. And then gymnophiona, Sicilians, all that stuff, they're, they're big. They're up here. They're, they're the blue. Um, now, there's probably reasons for this. Uh, in general, generally speaking, frogs, are, frogs and toads are fatter than uh, salamanders. You know, like salamanders this long and a toad is this long. Salamander will look like this. The toad will look like this. So that kind of explains that. But we're able to see that very, very easily with just some really simple GG plots. Again, this is all we've done up here. Now, I want to show you one more, maybe two more, really, really cool things that you can do. And I think the most important thing that you should learn for ggplot is how to facet wrap. No, this isn't the portion where me as trying to relate to the youth has a wrap about ggplot visualization practices. Uh, facet wrapping allows you to actually make multiple plots using uh, some type of data. And what we do is instead of facet wrap, we add a tilde, which is a little squiggly line. And let's say, uh, you know what, I want to actually facet wrap, I want to make three plots, one for each of the orders. So order. Let's run this. Let's go back to the plot. This is a really useful thing that I think you should learn. You can actually facet wrap along multiple variables. So if you want to show like a, a three by six thing of, I don't know, order to to size or something like, like there, there's ways to do it so that you can actually really do some advanced facet wrapping. Um, but yeah, so see, this is what I'm talking about. A facet wrap will produce three different plots for you. Uh, and all you need to do is facet wrap, squiggly line, the variable you want to produce over. This is really similar to that group by function, right? It's grouping by the order. So Anura, Kadata, uh, Gymnophiona. Now, there's uh, one or two other things that we can do with ggplot. Um, I really want you to focus on this is all we did for ggplot. Uh, ggplots are notorious for getting very, very complicated very, very quickly, but they do not have to be. Uh, I always say try to keep them very simple and then make them fancy. And really, the biggest thing to make them fancy is learning themes. Um, there are lots of pre-made themes. In the theme art function, you can actually edit every single portion of your GG plot. Uh, so if you want to hide axes, you want to change the color. Uh, in this case, I'm actually going to remove the legend and just legend. This this one always makes me laugh a little bit. I don't know why. But legend position, instead of saying, I don't know, we just put it as none. It has no position. Um, it is a, it, it'll just make it disappear is all I'm saying. Um, Learning those ggplot themes is really, really important uh, to actually making those, you know, publication quality plots. Uh, so once it does anything. Um, <clears throat> so the tilde this is actually perfect because we're going into the question and answer portion right now. Um, the tilde is often used to mean like as a function of. Um, it, 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 you'll use it a lot if you're building functions out, uh, just so you're on the same page legend position equals none remove the legend so it doesn't show it on the on the right hand side like uh, the previous plot um, but the tilde it just means as a function of uh, is sort of how I like to think about it so we're gonna facet wrap as a function of order so that it pulls out anura kadata gymnophiona um, if you're doing a multiple variable thing with tilde which is usually what you do for a linear model then I tend to think of it meaning uh, uh, like literally means as affected by. So, uh, you know what? People like to see stats. So, I'm going to take this as a question and answer portion. Again, this is technically the end. Uh, not really, but we have questions and answers. This is all the material I wanted to cover. Um, we, we just barely got into that time limit. Uh, but hey, if you have any questions, please leave them in chat. Um, because I, I just want to show you all stuff now. And one of the things is how to run a linear model, right? So, let's do LM. That's linear model in uh, R. Uh, so let's do our formula, right? Now, let's say we're doing it over that DF merge, and we, let's just do a super linear model with a body size and body mass. We'll just keep using those two variables. Uh, so we're going to do a DF uh, merge dollar sign. What this is saying is from that data set, I want you to pull this variable from the dollar sign. And let's just say, uh, again, if we're using that tilde, how is one thing affected by the other, right? So if I wanted the tilde, how is mass 
tilde affected by df merge body size in millimeters. Now, I ran that, ran that really quickly. We have an output in the console. This is a super simple linear model. I am not making any, I am probably violating multiple assumptions here. Um, with linear models though, I believe we have to wrap them in summary. I haven't used just the base R linear model in a while, but yeah. So now in summary, this actually gives you all the information you need for that linear model. Uh, so you get your coefficients, you get your residuals, and probably the thing that we all dread and fear and loathe, we get the p-value, and this is highly significant. Uh, probably because we have 200,000 records, and it's definitely going to show some type of uh, linear model. Um, so that's like the linear model in like two seconds. Uh, you can actually see the code right above it here on our console, LM linear model. There's lots of different models you can make in R. Uh, model building is great, but uh, yeah, it can also take up a lot of your time. Uh, we're actually building out models for bats at the moment and seeing how they are influenced by moon cycles. Uh, so that's a very fun, not at all fun model to build. Um, but yeah, so uh, just as a reminder, I, I will be sending out all of this material at the end. So we're, we still have time for questions and answers. You know, you don't have to if you want to ask more, please do so. But all of this will be put up on my website. Uh, and again, everything I've mentioned here, it's in that free ebook. Uh, and I, I want to be very clear. I do have a course, uh, you know, the moment of, the moment of uh, self promotion. I'll put myself over my. No, I won't do that. Um, I do have a course. Of course, the course is paid. Um, but. All of the material is actually for free in that ebook. Uh, the, the, the only thing the course gets you is video lessons for every single section. It gives you more of a track to actually learn step by step. Um, so this material right here is literally what's in that ebook. And there's quizzes, there's mastery checks. So the course is just extra on top of it. You can 100% learn for free from that ebook and from Google. I, I, I don't want you to feel like you have to buy a course, but I do have it. Um, and I feel like there was something else I was going to talk about on here, but, uh, you know, I've forgotten. And I'm just going to let this go for a while, uh, so don't worry too much about it. We can talk about anything. I'm just down to talk about data in R now that I've accomplished what I needed to accomplish. Uh, oh, and if you have to go, thank you for showing. I, I don't want you to feel like, you have to, you're, like you're like a captive audience. Um, and uh, so the course, uh, so I always say this, I always, always, always say this, don't buy it full price, buy it on sale. Uh, it's $90, uh, that's free, unlimited, lifetime access. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a, uh, it took me a few months. Um, I'm for Bat and Moon Phase. Bat and Moon Phase is a very interesting project. Um, so that one's actually down with the Toucan Ridge Ecology and Education Society. Uh, I go down there a lot. I actually run trips out there. So if you're interested in supporting conservation, um, and uh, will you cover PCA in the course? I do not cover PCA in the course because I, I've hyper-focused it on very simple things. The next one I want to do is uh, summary status, summary statistics, there we go, uh, and analysis and visualization. Um, so uh, I'm seeing a couple questions. Uh, I've had instructors that want us to write code in a text editor like Sublime Text. I also use Sublime Text. Um, it is, let me make sure it's, yeah. So I use Sublime Text as well uh, because it's awesome. So this is like some of the phylogenies I'm working with. This is the, is this the turtle phylogeny? Yeah, this is the turtle phylogeny. Uh, Sublime Text makes it a lot easier, even though this looks awful, or for things like outputs from my data sets. Um, I, I don't know why some people really like to code in, um, code in R or code in sublime text. I, I understand for some cases it's useful. Um, but if you're using like Python, I think a lot of people want to use it on here. However, actually, uh, recently within the last year, our studio uh, now allows you to run Python scripts. So I run my Python now in our studio. I'm not an expert in Python and I do not feel comfortable giving a course in Python. Um, but I do have friends that want to. So um, where is a good place to find data sets? Great ask because I can plug something of mine. Um, a lot of data sets I end up finding on just random websites or I, I actively look for open access data sets. I kind of have a backwards way of doing research. I actually look for what data is available and then I build the project around that. 
Um, I, I think it's a much more realistic way. But uh, I actually used a, I actually created an open access database recently. Um, so this is in the blog, and uh, basically this is just a database. <laughs> Please tell me the blog actually has a link. Okay. Um, but this is an open access database of open access data. Uh, so, uh, for example, GBIF is on here, Open Traits Network, Amphibio, the one we used, is also on here. I just have a ton of different data sets and I keep updating it whenever someone says it. But um, yeah, so if you want to figure out, like, uh, cool, the USGS has a protected area database of the United States, you can click on it and it will open up directly to that data source, assuming I have the correct link and everything. Um, but this is one way to find it. I also have filters and search bars. Uh, I think there's like 30 data sets here right now. Nothing too crazy. But uh, yeah, if you're wanting to do like biogeography stuff, this this is perfect for you. It should have almost everything you need. Um, you did a bad internship down at Trees, then uh, we are very, very likely using the data from your hard effort. Thank you so much for helping collect that. Uh, I have a few in my own. I'm not the best with bats, but uh, yeah, we're, we're seeing it. We actually have found some like really early results. You know, Don't take them for a grain of salt, but we're finding that the smaller species, so uh, the Arbutus species, they are, um, they are uh, actually highly influenced by the moon cycle. So the moon cycle is a, a sine wave, is how it's represented in our model, uh, because like basically it's like illumination, you know, full moon to new moon, uh, we find those species almost follow that moon cycle perfectly, which this is well known in literature and also anecdotally from lots of people is that wildlife is affected by moon cycles. However, the big species, uh, wait, no, no, sorry, not Arbutus, Corolia. Corolia is influenced by the species. Arbutus, the larger species, uh, not influenced by moon cycle at all. It's just like a straight line through our graph. So really cool stuff. Uh, do I use the terminal in R? I do use the terminal, but I use it more for bug testing. So if there's like an error in the code, I'll just run the code repeatedly. Uh, so it's, it's really good for just testing stuff out up here. I, I try my hardest to keep my scripts uh, more organized, <laughs> but of course it doesn't always work. Uh, so maybe down here, I would just be playing around with variables uh, down in the console. So it, it's, it's useful. You should learn how to use it as well. Um, and so I uh, so there's a question of did I teach myself R or did I have classes that taught me and uh, Cassandra is saying us that uh, they had two biostat classes during the masters and found them really unhelpful. Uh, so I'm 100% self-taught. I just kind of had an interest in coding. I really liked uh, I was actually in like game design and flash animation when I was in high school. So that was kind of like my voyage. I don't know. That's probably using that word wrong. But anyways, I, I got into computers through that stuff. Um, and then R, I just realized that not a lot of people know it, and I am pretty good at it. Like, I, I, I can cl it clicks for me, but for my master's, I wanted to get really better, so that's why I pushed myself to do a big, big, giant project. Um, I will add CCH2 onto the Open Access Database. Um, but I also have that same experience of the classes I took were awful. Um, they, it's like an intro to R course that already assumes you know how to use R, or they, they take so long to cover very basic subjects. So when I built out the course and the textbook and all that, it was really like, what is the course that I wish I had? And what is the course that I wish I could give to a collaborator? That's sort of my idea of how I did it. And that's why I didn't... I didn't assume any knowledge at all with it, and that's how I do all my courses, uh, planned courses. We got more coming up, uh, but also just I, I, I think a lot of people need that, and they just need it to be broken down, not in like this is a computer scientist writing for biologists. It's like let's let's let a biologist write it for biologists. Um, computer scientists can also be biologists. That's actually a lot of them, but y you know what I'm saying. Uh, am I planning on doing more webinars on different topics? Absolutely. Uh, so this is the second time I've done a webinar webinar. Uh, I live stream my research and my process a lot on YouTube. Uh, it hasn't been in the past month because I've been traveling and stuff, but I'm going to do that again. And I really, really like it. And it is, uh, I, I love doing webinars and I want to do them on more topics. Uh, they're not always going to be a, uh, a side to the, um, uh, they're not always going to be like assigned with a course and all that because I, I 
don't want to always just promote, promote, promote. But uh, for example, I, I want to do one on uh, ggplot, like just a webinar on data visualization in ggplot, where I don't cover how to load in data. I, I don't cover any of that. We just start with the data set, and we just focus on ggplot. We just make beautiful ggplots, where I walk you through the themes. I walk you through really useful tips and tricks. Um, I want to do one on just GBIF data. Of course, I am building a course on using GBIF data, so that's probably why. But I, I love it, and it's such an amazing one. And then, yeah, SciComm courses. That that's a huge one. I really want to do more. Um, I'm realizing, like, I, you know, I always think in terms of a multi-year plan. And and I, I, being very honest with AI, I don't really know if. Uh, courses on how to code are going to be that useful for the next 10 years. So I really want to focus more on how to use data, how to understand that data, how to know with this specific type of data, what are the issues? Uh, I wanted to talk, focus more on evolutionary theory of like, how does genetic drift actually affect populations? So stuff that's more conceptual that an AI can help, but at the end of the day, it needs to be taught. Um, oh yeah, and I, I love how every time I mention bad our coding courses everyone's like i got a story for you but it's true it's true and it's, some of that is um just lots of issues with uh who they're designing the course for and what the department can give them and but i don't know i, I always feel like they could be better i actually taught a uh, well i was a ta for biostatistics and we didn't teach them R, but we had them code in R, so kind of teaching them R. And it was just so slow. I mean, like the last thing we covered after a whole semester of stuff was ANOVA or, or Chi-squared, I think. Like very, like almost nothing really. And they we didn't teach them tidyverse, which is realistically, if you're gonna use R, you're gonna use tidyverse. Um, do I have any experience with meta barcoding analyses? I do not. Um, but I will say that in terms of just data manipulation and just R, I, I can usually figure it out. Um, like, in terms of like the actual, this is kind of what I was going about, like the coding I can do, but in terms of understanding that data and understanding the nuances with meta barcoding, I haven't worked with it, so I don't know it. Uh, but hey, if you just need help like manipulating tables and lists and objects and all that, I, I got you. Like, that is my thing. Uh, maybe that's something I'll just start learning on the side. Uh, lately, I've actually been really, really, really interested in species distribution models. Uh, some of the more advanced ones, like joint species distribution models, you can actually uh, use co-occurring species as a variable to, to affect it. But that's that's besides the point. I have I, I bought a book about it. Like I'm really into these super cool analyses nowadays. But I need to finish my master's. I need to stop doing new projects. I am planning a course on modeling. Um, I am planning a course on modeling. It's it's one where I, I can stumble through models really well, and I, I can figure out a model, but I, I think I need to go back to the source material to better understand models really well. Um, it's like if I'm on a project, I can build you a model, but I need to teach it. I, I think I need a better understanding before I feel comfortable having a full course. But that being said, uh, with this specific course, with this webinar, I didn't feel great about ggplot. Uh, I actually really struggled with ggplot. Um, and doing this course forced me to learn it. And I actually have noticed how much easier I can do ggplot now. Um, just, just like off the cuff, no notes, no nothing. Like, of course, I have notes for this webinar because um, I'm not dealing with issues. Um, merging 18 data frames into one big data frame. Will merge be useful? Uh, merge can be very useful for that. Uh, something you might consider is, um, so if they all have the same data name, you know what, let's, uh, let's, fuck it, let's, 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 let's do some stuff. Let's figure it out. Because uh, something I actually removed from this webinar is for loops. For loops are incredibly important to learn. Uh, I like, but they're not often used. So let's do something like for i. So basically, a for loop says for every iteration of some data, do some code. Uh, so I'm going to do for i in one through ten. We're going to make you a bunch of different data sets, um, and what we're going to do is we're going to assign them to a list. Lists are an object I didn't cover here, but lists is just hold other objects. So 
Like we have an object that's like a data frame or a matrix or a vector or a single value. All of those are objects. Lists are also objects, but they're an object that holds other objects. So we could have put all of our data sets inside of a list, and then it's just one object that we can work with. So uh, let's just do list and I. Let's make a data frame. Let's make it's data.frame. Uh, this is how you make a data frame from scratch. And let's make it have three columns. Uh, so we're going to call them. Uh, we're going to call them uh, ID. Oh, I'm trying to remember now. Uh, all the same columns. 18 CSVs need to be merged into one big data frame. I'm using a for loop to get a data frame, and then I'm confused on how to merge. I, I, I'm guessing here you might be able to L apply or for loop on that list. Uh, so let's do ID is equal to one, one through. Let's make it one through ten. Don't need to complicate it. Uh, we'll just have uh, val one b r norm. Uh, we'll do ten of these with uh, yeah, screw it. We'll just do ten of those, and then we'll just have val two uh, is equal to sample uh, letters. Boom. Uh, size. I think ten will work. Let's see. Uh, boop, 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 boop. Yeah, I messed up somewhere here. <laughs> oh, maybe I'm supposed to do it just like that. Maybe that's the thing. Uh, do, 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 do. I might have messed up somewhere here. This is what happens when you do it right off the cuff. Um, I'm probably just missing something. Object of type built in is not subsettable. Uh, but this should work, right? This this portion is working. So that's working. So basically, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make. Uh, 10 different data sets that are like this, where they have the ID column, val1, val2 column. And these are just doing pulling from a normal distribution. Uh, and then the val2 column is sampling from all the letters of the alphabet 10 times. So just to have some different data that looks different. Um, this is something I actually do a lot. You really need to learn, like honestly, learn how to make your own data sets, like dummy data. Because for these manipulation questions, sometimes working with your own data just sucks. Um, and then why am I? Oh, you know what? I don't think I have a list is the problem. Is equal to a list. Boom. OK, so now we're calling our list L. And I do think it is the double I. Ha, that'll work. OK, cool. So now, like I showed you, we have a list. What's your iNaturalist username? It's probably Diljone, D-I-L-L-J-O-N-E. Uh, but yeah, so in this list now, we have 10 data frames, right? Each of them has the ID column, which is consistent. Um, I just thought about this. Uh, so when you're saying you want to merge your data sets, so just, just making sure we're clarifying here. Are, do you expect them to just be stacked on one another? So like data set one is here to here, data set two is here to here, data set three is here to here. Or are you actually merging them? Like they have lots of different values and whatnot. Because um, that can change things a little bit. But uh, while I wait on that answer, I will show L apply. L apply means apply some function over a list. Uh, so what do we want to apply? We want to apply it over the list L. And then let's do a function. Let's just do, um, let's see what happens if I do C bind. Um, hmm, that's not working like I thought it would. It's been a while since I've had to do something like this. We could do it in a for loop, of course. Um, list out. And yeah, I kind of assumed. Um, so this is making a list of 10. That's not what we want. Um, they will be stacked after each other. Ah, you do not want merge. You want C bind, uh, C bind and R bind. So uh, what this does is C bind stands for column bind, and R bind stands for row bind. So you uh, you're binding data sets by columns or by rows. Um, and I'm not gonna lie. I get very confused about them all the time, and I have to like run them through my head. So let's just say we are R binding. Um, let's let's do uh, the first two entries of our list that we created. So L1 and L2. So what you'll see here uh, in the console. So I just did R bind. So that's row bind again. Uh, zoom console. It just stacks them just like this. Um, I've been to add another column, which will have the file name of the file it's being taken from. Uh, so you're going to want the rbind function just to get that out of the way. If all the columns are the same, that's all you'll need. rbind is your friend. Uh, it'll work. Um, now, if you're wanting to have another column that has the file name of the file it's being taken from, your, your 
easiest thing to do is to just add that in R. Um, the quickest way, if we go back to our source, is if we go into DF, right? DF, uh, let's say that, that's the name of your data frame, that's the name of the first one. Um, if you add that dollar sign and just do, uh, let's say, file name, this is going to add that file name. I'm just going to make it some some garbage. Uh, so now in our, let me not, let me add this on a DF merge because there's a lot of variables in DF. So if we put this on DF merge, file name, file name does not exist uh, in this data set yet. We can actually see that in environment. So on DF merge, there is no uh, file name thing. Uh, and uh, by adding this, I'm going to run the code. You can see it just added file name and added that word over and over again. So that's probably your easiest bet. There's ways to make your code cleaner, and you know you can use a, a for loop or whatever. And so Brienne is asking about left joining. So left joins uh, are actually kind of what I was showing here. So merge, merge, you can do left joins, inner joins, outer joins, uh, right joins, and all that's saying is that like. I, uh, an inner join is basically what we were doing here, right? This uh, this first one where we're just joining the overlapping because on a Venn diagram, it's the inner ones, right? Uh, but let me zoom back out. A left join is the left data set, right? So just pulling that left data set. Um, I, I, I really wanted to teach this one with left joins and joins in general because that's also from Tidyverse. Um, but I, I find for for intro level stuff, the merge function is a lot simpler for people. I, I don't know, there's something about it that just clicks more. Um, but if I also do highly recommend learning SQL uh, because this is like a big part of it is joins and you would be surprised how much you uh, will actually use SQL and database design in your biology data. Um, okay, cool. I, I'm, I'm glad the R binding helped. Um, yeah, and I mean like there's... There's ways to make it go very, very fast. Uh, 18 data sets is right at that, it's right at that point where it's a lot of work to do it manually, but it's almost more work to automate it. Um, Cause I'm like struggling to properly do it in my head. You should be able to apply the function. You could absolutely do a for loop. Um, like, like the way we do it on a for loop actually. So let's do, uh, we have our list now. Actually, yeah, we have our list. So let's just say it's all on the list. And let's do for one in through length. Uh, let me show you this. For one through length of list. So, uh, or length of L, sorry, because we're calling it L. So length of L is going to be the, the, the length of the list, like how many entries. And down in the console, we see we have 10, 10 entries of length L. Uh, so this is going to go from one through 10 in our case. And let's, uh, let's eliminate this code because we're not making a data set. So let's say we have some out list. Let's call it list. Uh, no, actually, let's call it it's a data frame. So df out. Um, and we're going to make it an empty data frame with those same column names. So id. Um, oh, god, I forgot what we called them all. Oh, val1 and val2. Val1, I just deleted the thing, val2. Uh, oops, sorry, we need to actually specify. And we're going to make them all blank for now. Uh, this is just setting it up so that you have the same column names so that uh, our bind will work properly. So now we have an empty data frame. Uh, it will make one observation. Sorry, let me show you an environment. It will make one observation that is like that. Um, there's, there's a way to do it that you don't have it like that. I'm just lazy <laughs> and this is what i do uh you should be using as character as numeric and that works really well but um, i'm showing you the lazy quick way because we're not making this perfect but then in sorry in that for loop uh we will now have df out r bind uh df out so it's going to overwrite df out by r binding that current data set with an element of the list so in l Two exclamation, two square brackets, i, because that'll be the ith record in L. So the first record, then the second, and the third. And if we run this, boom, there we go. You now have all of your data in one data frame, from list to data. Uh, this is like the easy way of doing it. There are functions that are specifically made for doing this. Um, I tend to learn the basics. So let me also uh, put this here. And you know what? 
I am going to make this a little bit easier on you. I'm going to paste this right into the chat. So you can copy and paste it if you need it. Um, but yeah, uh, so it may not be formatted properly when you paste it, but it doesn't look like it is. But hey, there's the code. So yeah, it's a uh, pretty simple, uh, Pretty simple way of doing it. I, I, I prefer to code in this fashion of learn the actual, I don't know what to call it, like the basics. Uh, in that way, you can really do anything with for loops. Um, the apply functions are really powerful. I, I kind of get lost in them every now and then. Uh, but apply is really, really powerful as well um, and can help out for loops, particularly if you're working in bioinformatics data, large data sets, genetic data sets, stuff like that. Um, it is uh, more important to use apply because it's a little more efficient than for loops. But um, I've, I've rarely run into issues needing that with most data. Yeah, OK, yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad it works out for you. Um, our, our binding is really useful. And, and if you wanted to combine them, like combine columns together, you could also do C bind. Um, but the problem with that is it doesn't actually merge things properly. So if I had a bunch of data sets that had species, columns, and uh, you know, body mass, body size, whatever, and I wanted to C bind them, uh, they would have to be the same number of rows. <coughs> and they would have to be in that same order. So you may have species A, species B, species C. The next data set may have species B, species C, species E. Um, and, and it would combine them together, and it wouldn't look right. So that's why you'd use merge for that. Oh, and uh, yes, the video will be uploaded. Um, I, I usually keep just the full recording here. Uh, however, on the website, I am going to make a dedicated page that hosts the video. Uh, that is edited down a little bit so it doesn't have the, the long intro at the start, but also has the R markdown, basically all of the code that we wrote here. Um, let me actually show you what I'm working with. Um, so these are my notes for it. Uh, and there's just a little bit more information. So I like these are also like my speaking notes, uh, the code just to have reference, but it's a little more thorough. So uh, for example, I show you all the different merges. I'll make sure to add in the infographic showing like what a all x, all y, all equals true type of thing looks like. Um, different summaries, a little more in depth on ggplot. So it just has a little bit of extra information and that'll live all on the website, uh, you know, perfectly. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Um, but you know what? We are, uh, we're over by a bit. I need to get some lunch, get some food in me. Uh, thank you all for, for showing up. Uh, I really love doing these webinars. And if there's any topic that you want or something really specific that you want to see, uh, just shoot me a DM, shoot me an email. Uh, I, I'd be happy to do it. A lot of these I, I just can put together pretty quickly um, and do. It's just really the actual, the, actually the marketing takes more time than the actual webinar. Uh, but yeah. So I uh, think I'll have a have a wonderful day. Uh, happy coding and uh, get out there and uh, do some biologying, biologists. You got this. Have a good one. Thanks. <laughs>